those of you who don't know, I am now the past president of the Society for Industrial Archaeology, passing the torch to uh, Saul Tannenbaum at our Zoom uh, board meeting, general uh, members meeting uh, last month. And uh, we, uh, we have rescheduled the conference for Bethlehem next June. So hopefully there'll be a vaccine and we can all show up in person as much as possible. Um, so I'm talking today about the Nashville toll bridge abutment. Um, I am a hair architect uh, celebrating my 30 years there at Hare now and um, historic American engineering record of the National Park Service. For the last uh, 15, 16, 17 years, I was also the uh, head of the uh, project director for the Hare National Covered Bridge Recording Project. We documented over 100 bridges, of which this is one. Uh, we also did a couple publications, including uh, this book that I did with uh, Justine Christensen, who's on the call, uh, Covered Bridges and the Birth of American Engineering. And uh, we recently finished uh, these uh, guidelines for rehabilitation for historic covered bridges. And uh, we have extra copies available, so feel free to uh, contact me. Okay, the preservation of the Nashville Toll Bridge abutments represents a successful partnership between the National Park Service, Tennessee Department of Transportation, and Nashville-based Nash Native History Association to rediscover an historic monument to the cultural displacement represented by the Trail of Tears as well as an industrial archaeology project representing early American bridge engineering. The abutment stands along the Cumberland River in downtown Nashville, right off the public market in Courthouse Square that was the center uh, of town in the early 19th century. The toll bridge was on a major route uh, crossing the state southeast from um, Chattanooga and Murfreesboro on the Murfreesboro Pike uh, coming up here. Crossing over the Cumberland and downtown Nashville, first major bridge in Nashville, and then heading northwest on the Gallatin Pike. Uh, we visited the bridge in the uh, tour of fall tour in Nashville with the SIA. In 2015, this is the view from the Ziegenthaler Bridge, which goes over the football stadium. So this is uh, Broad Street speakeasies. This used to be the ferry landing. You can see the 19th century architecture with the warehouses serving the ferry boat traffic. And then we walked along the river under this one bridge and the abutment is right around here. Uh, right below the uh, Victory Memorial Bridge and right near the uh, courthouse in downtown Nashville. Uh, the stone abutment was largely forgotten until 2012 when Pat Cummins and Toy Heap of the Nashville based Native History Association wondered if the remains could possibly be linked to the Trail of Tears. So you had this wall that's in the middle of the picture, but you had other stone walls behind it from other warehouses. So uh, what was this wall and how did it fit with uh, Nashville history? Background on the Trail of Tears, it represents the tragic forced migration of Native Americans from their homelands to the Oklahoma Territory. It, begins with, it began with policies to solve the Indian problem uh, back under Thomas Jefferson, but gained, gained steam under President Andrew Jackson. The Indian Removal Act was signed in 1830, but was fought by various tribes and their states for several years. Uh, but by 1837-38, uh, uh, different uh, tribal leaders agreed to lead their delegations and follow different routes over um, both land and water routes. Uh, after difficulties with the forced migration with different army troops, Chief John Ross was given the authority 
to lead groups of his own people. And all he helped, or he and other leaders and chiefs helped orchestrate 14 detachments, uh, most in the summer and winter of 1838. The effects of these trips were devastating. Of the over 15,000 Native Americans removed, thousands died during these trips. Others deserted and many perished even after arriving in their new homeland, Oklahoma. Uh, here's a map from the National Park Service uh, in central Tennessee. It is now an official National Historic Trail, the Trail of Tears. Uh, you can see the red line crossing through Nashville. That represents the northern route that started in uh, Charleston and Blythe Ferry on the Hawassi and Tennessee River in the southeast corner, uh, crossed across the state, uh, going over turnpikes and toll roads, crossing over the toll bridge in uh, Nashville, heading up into Tennessee, into Kentucky, and then they uh, spent the winter at uh, Barry's Ferry there um, on the Ohio River before they could cross uh, the river in the spring into Illinois, continue through Missouri and on to Oklahoma. So the question was, was this, was this bridge structure uh, part of the Trail of Tears? And if so, it would be the only surviving bridge, bridge structure uh, extant. Uh, here's a contemporary news report uh, from the Republican banner in December 4th, 1838, and a view of the bridge. Uh, saying that came through, the Cherokees came through last Sunday, numbering 1,800 in number, and they will suffer intensely uh, over the winter until they arrive at their new location. Uh, there was a uh, ledger book from the bridge in the archives, uh, but when we looked up December 1838, we could find no record of uh, Cherokees paying toll uh, so that's kind of a mystery how to, if they had to pay toll or would they wave through or not. Um, in 2013, uh, National Historic Trails uh, CRM Chief Michael Romero Taylor out in the Santa Fe office contacted me and asked if Hare could get involved with uh, figuring out the question about these abutments. Um, I recommended that uh, my colleague, uh, Jim Barker, an historic bridge engineer in Indiana, first do a preliminary site, site assessment of the uh, abutment of the wall in uh, November 2013. So here he is atop the overgrown site uh, in 2013. And then he produced a report from that uh, meanwhile, uh, Cummins had found a relative gold mine of material, uh, primary source material at the Tennessee State Museum and Archives in Nashville. Uh, beginning with this map, um, this 1832 map, you can see uh, Nashville in the center of the state. Uh, you can also see some of the major rivers and how Nashville uh, was able to communicate on uh, in the inland waterway uh, with uh, pack, early packet boat traffic in the 1820s from uh, New Orleans, as well as uh, on the Ohio River from Louisville, communicating with Louisville, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh. Uh, inset, I'm not sure where that music's coming from. Uh, inset in the map is this uh, view of Nashville, and if you zoom in on the Nashville map, at the right you can see a covered bridge uh, kind of canting to the right. So it's going from the high ground of the original settlement of Nashville with its early uh, capital building, and then going to the east end on the sandy side across the river at a lower elevation. Uh, this is the only known uh, contemporary view of the Nashville Toll Bridge 
which was built in uh, 1819. Uh, they also, we also found a uh, Nashville Bridge Company um, folder, which included this original 1819 contract. And this was a real gold, gold mine. Um, it includes uh, specs for building the bridge, for erecting the bridge over the Cumberland River, using um, contracting with Philadelphia Bridge architect Joseph Johnston, for $75,000. It'll be erected on the principles of Lewis Wernwag's patent as displayed in his New Hope, Reading, and Pittsburgh bridges. And it goes into sizes and specs. The abutment shall front 52 feet wide, battering one inch to the foot. And the superstructure shall consist of three arches, each of 200 feet, which is like huge for the time. Um, and then interestingly, how they'll be connected, each arch shall be composed of three segments, uh, elevation of 13 feet and a half in the center. Each of the um, arch segments shall be composed of six ribs of choice timber, uh, measuring six by 12 inches, will be set in cast iron head blocks and confined together with strong iron clamps and screw bolts. Uh, Prevented from coming into contact by one inch iron bars placed between them six feet asunder. And uh, it includes getting the uh, contract and the patent rights from Lewis Wernweg. So this was very exciting to be able to figure out how we might be able to reconstruct how the bridge and the truck look. And the other thing we found was Lewis Wernweg was a famous covered bridge builder in the first half of the 19th century, one of the pioneer bridge builders. And uh, he was also a promoter. And this is a uh, broadside that he published fairly widely. And it shows his three uh, bridges that he's promoting in 1813. In the middle is the Colossus Bridge in Philadelphia. And at the top is the New Hope Bridge that's referenced in the contract. Uh, this is the view of the Colossus Bridge in Philadelphia on the Schuylkill River. Uh, behind it, uh, many of y'all recognize the Fairmount Waterworks in Philadelphia. And uh, this is a huge uh, single span, 340 foot arch, uh, with largest bridge at the time. The very, very famous, uh, the Colossus in Philadelphia. And uh, here's some of the details that are mentioned in the contract. And uh, Lee Nelson, a National Park Service alumni professor in Oregon, uh, wrote a great book on documenting the bridge called The Colossus of 1812. And uh, he did drawings uh, showing how the arch uh, would have worked from uh, Wernwag's designs. And here's a isometric cover uh, cutaway he drew, and this shows the spacers in between the, uh, the timbers. So this help, helps uh, increase the cross section of the timber of the arch so that it's much taller and wider, uh, but it also breathes to prevent rot from the timbers. And he's also a pioneer in that he's using a lot of uh, cast and wrought iron fittings. Uh, well ahead of a how, the Howe Trust that came along 20 years later. So he's using wrought iron uh, rods for, uh, to help with tension for diagonals and all these fittings to help bind the uh, arch members together. And then here's a view of the New Hope Bridge and uh, its details. And this, this is a slightly different design than the Colossus and that it's more of a tied arch, as you can see the cast iron uh, in, that's holding the, uh, the end of the arch on the left above the abutment. So it's basically the sitting atop the abutment is more of a tied arch than a traditional uh, burr arch, which was also in fashion at the time. And how do we know about the New Hope Bridge? Well, there are some photographs. It had a 
half the bridge had been lost in a flood in 1843 in the six span, uh, 175 foot uh, span each bridge at New Hope, north of Trenton on the Delaware. The three of the original had survived. And then there was uh, another uh, storm in 1903 that washed the rest of the bridge away. But this great photo shows some of the, one of the original Wernwag trusses. And from this, you can see the uh, Wernwag design. So if you compare the uh, drawing with the photograph, you can see some of the uh, arch members being bound together with the cast iron spaces and bolting and some of the uh, wrought iron rods, tension rods. Uh, we also know, we also have a few images of the Wernwag Bridge built in uh, Pittsburgh. This bridge was built by Joseph, jo with a partnership with Wernwag and Joseph Johnson, who won the Nashville contract. And uh, even though you can't see the truss, you can see uh, this multi-span bridge built at Smithfield Street, uh, the original Smithfield Street Bridge in 1816. And you can also see this view of the uh, toll house, a two-story toll house with decorative arch uh, in both uh, carriageways and pedestrian ways. So very decorative uh, city bridge, which several of the covered bridges that were built in urban areas had a uh, decorative portals back in that era period. This is the last known bridge that he did. Uh, later in his career, he did move to a more traditional Burr arch design, and his modification was uh, where you have a uh, combination arch and truss, uh, but instead of a normal uh, straight vertical uh, post, his, his posts were more diagonal radiating in the center of the bridge. And this bridge at Camp Nelson, Kentucky lasted until 1933. Uh, so after uh, Jim Barker wrote his preliminary report, um, I decided it was good for Hare to get involved and do more documentation, large format and digital photography, and uh, write a full uh, Hare uh, narrative report um, to document the bridge and the trust. So we were able to put together a field team uh, in March of 2015, um, including uh, and get a boat to go visit the bridge. Uh, I'm in the center of the picture and next to me is a photographer, Martin Stupich, who uh, flew in from, drove in from Albuquerque for the project. Uh, here's one of Marty's digital photographs. Uh, the best vantage point to see the bridge is from the Cumberland River. Um, also, he's able to take a telephoto from across the river. Uh, the abutment is interesting in that it had these, these slits that you can see, as well as these uh, cast iron fittings atop the uh, bridge. And uh, what we believe was the case is that the slits were not for to hold an arch, like a, a burr arch or an arch bridge, but they were used for like diagonal uh, false work when the bridge was being put together. And these uh, wrought iron uh, rods at, atop the bridge, which were spaced seven and a half feet apart, um, probably were used both in construction as well as tie downs if there was ever uh, floodwaters this high on the uh, river. Uh, we worked in partnership with the Tennessee Department of Transportation, which owned the site, being that it was right below the Victor Memorial Bridge on US 41. Uh, they, their archaeology crew came out and uh, dug some uh, test pits and holes uh, for the, to try to find out, we could find out about the bridge. Uh, they had a lot of great archaeological finds, including some of the hardware that seems to match from a Wernwag's design. And uh, here's a, uh, one of the wrought iron rods that seems to match one of the uh, tension rods in the design of the arch of the uh, truss. Uh, here's a view of the abutment after it's been weed whacked and uh, grass planted. 
uh, next to the modern bridge. And if you look across, you can see on the, the lower elevation side on the east, east Nashville, uh, the east abutment of the bridge. This is in much less uh, good shape as the uh, west side, the, the city side of the bridge. It appears that several of the face stones were robbed uh, for construction of some of the more modern bridges uh, built nearby in the 1950s and 1970s. Uh, but here's a great view from Marty uh, across the river of the uh, east side of the bridge. So you can see some of the face stones at the, in the front and behind it in sectional view. Uh, it appears to be the uh, fill for the roadway for the Gallatin pipe that can continued on the east side and continued north uh, to Kentucky. Uh, so following the, uh, the locals uh, finding of the bridge and confirmation of the stone wall as an abutment, it was added to this uh, survey, building survey of the Trail of Tears completed by uh, Amy Kostein of Middle Tennessee State University where she uh, made a list of witness sites, meaning other uh, plantation houses, taverns, ferry sites, and traces along the uh, multi-state trail of tier system. And then the National Park Service uh, did an official uh, recognition of the abutment in 2014. Uh, and uh, Aaron Marr, superintendent, of the Santa Fe office flew out and uh, met with uh, Troy and uh, Pat in the middle and T dot and the also in the um, also in the picture uh, to certify the bridge. And this agreement says that the owner of the property, um, Tennessee DOT, will maintain the structure and do a management plan to stabilize the project and interpret it. And uh, they did work, they did use the hair documentation as part of their interpretive design. And uh, these two plaques were put up in 2019. Uh, so this is two years after uh, the SIA had visited the site. And uh, these have been uh, placed up. And uh, here you can see on the bottom, on the, the view on the left, showing the view from the uh, of the bridge and one of Mar Marty Stupich's photographs um, using our documentation. And this is a good example of a partnership between the Park Service, Tennessee DOT, and Native History Association to preserve this important reminder of America's legacy of segregation and racism, which is something we're going through now. Uh, and this reminder of the Trail of Teal, tra on the Trail of Tears National Historic Park, National Historic Trail. Thank you very much.